it's a celebration here at Lowell Observatory because it's the Perseids tonight. And yeah, it's definitely worth cleaning up all of this confetti at 1030 tonight when we're done here because the Perseids is one of the biggest meteor showers of the year. Uh, my name is Megan Jaluka. I'm a research assistant and as you can see, future astronomer and icon. And yes, two out of three of those titles are self-proclaimed. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm going to be taking you guys through a little bit of Perseids information. And then at the end of the night, we're going to do a trivia session. I'm super excited for the trivia and the last four questions will have winners. The people who win the last four trivia questions are going to receive a very great history book on Lowell Observatory's Clark Refracting Telescope. Now, before I jump into uh, Perseids talk, let's take a quick look at the LDT All Sky Camera. So you might notice it on your screen. Uh, it is should be up in the right corner, but hopefully now it is featured in the center of the screen. Thank you, um, my team at Lowell. Uh, and basically, the LDT All Sky Camera is over at our research site, the Lowell Discovery Telescope and it is watching the sky for us all night long and whenever we need it to. Sadly, as you can see right now, it is completely overcast in Flagstaff, um, well, more accurately, Happy Jack, where the LDT is, but that doesn't matter because I have some pre-recorded Perseids meteors that me and the rest of the science team here at Little Observatory were able to catch last night. Um, so let's jump back to the PowerPoint and let's get talking about the Perseids. All right, so once again, I just want to tell everybody that we're going to be having meteor trivia tonight. Four of the far end of the journey, Lowell Observatory's 24-inch Clark Telescope coffee table books are up for grabs and the prestigious title of Meteor Master, which is, of course, bestowed upon you by me. <laughs> um, and uh, that'll be the last thing we do tonight. So when we get there, I'll explain the rules for that. But my hint for you guys is that if you pay attention to what I'm about to tell you about for the next 30, 40 minutes, you should have all the answers necessary to become a meteor master. Um, now, I just want to uh, remind everybody that we would love it if you could like and subscribe to Little Observatory's YouTube channel. We've been trying to post lots of content here in order to uh, mitigate the fact that we can't have as large groups of public into the observatory itself. So let's get ready with some terms. Um, so basically what you're seeing on your screen here is a little diagram. So we have the Earth. The Earth's atmosphere is given by the red circle. And we have a meteor trajectory, which is the white line. And on that trajectory is a meteoroid. So a meteoroid is the first important term in meteor science. It is the rock, particle, or piece of debris in space that's going to become a meteor when the Earth intercepts it. Now, once the uh, meteoroid hits the Earth's atmosphere, it's going to burn up and become a meteor. So the meteor is the actual uh, light phenomenon that you see streak across the sky. That process that causes it to burn up is called ablation. Now, lastly, if that meteoroid manages to survive its meteor phase and make it to the ground here on Earth, that is when we call it a meteorite. And this is the thing that um, scientists get to go pick up off the ground or anybody can pick up the ground if you're lucky. <laughs> All right, so meteor showers now on the other hand, like the Perseids, are created when the Earth moves through streams of meteoroids that are all on the same orbit. Now these meteoroid streams are all usually caused by one particular object. So one specific comet is responsible for a meteor shower. Um, which brings me to parent bodies of meteors. Number one, the one I was just mentioning, are comets. They are long period objects that travel to the very outermost regions of the solar system. Now, by long period, I mean it takes them a very long time to orbit around the sun. When they come close to the sun, the sun heats them up and they start to release particles and debris um, and they release it all in the same orbital track. And this is a meteoroid stream. Now, when the Earth moves through the meteoroid stream, once again, we get the meteor showers. The second common type of parent bodies for meteors are asteroids. They have much more circular orbits, much more planetary-like orbits, and they typically live between Mars and Jupiter in the main asteroid belt, or they live with Pluto in the Kuiper belt. Now, if we're going to place these objects in the solar system, first off, the asteroid is going to go right between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt, and then the comet is going to go 
way away from the solar system, even as far as what we call the Oort cloud, which is the furthest region of the solar system. Um, so once again, I just want to remind everybody that the Perseids can be seen from anywhere as long as you have good weather. Um, and also, if anybody happens to see the all sky camera clearing up, be sure to tell me because I'd love to take a look at that. So the Perseid meteor shower, let's talk about specifics. The Perseids have a known parent body, Comet 109P Swift Tuttle. It's a really interesting comet. It takes 133 years to orbit the sun and it will return to us in just about 100 years. Uh, now Giovanni Schiaparelli first realized that Comet Swift Tuttle was the source of the Perseids. Um, and yes, it is the same Giovanni that inspired Percival Lowell here at the observatory to study the canals on Mars. So this is a map that Giovanni Schiaparelli created of what he called the Canali of Mars. Um, and apparently when they translated this into English, uh, they didn't do a very good job because instead of translating it to mean channels, which are naturally occurring, they got canals. And that's what started the um, very long period of people thinking there were Martians. Now, another interesting fact about the Perseids is that it produces spectacular meteors being well known for fireballs. It's one of the largest meteor showers of the year. It produces 50 to 100 meteors per hour, which is a crazy amount of meteors. You're guaranteed to see um, at least a couple meteors if you're able to go out in a clear dark location and look up for a, uh, a fairly solid amount of time, like an hour. Um, fireballs are meteors that achieve the same or brighter than Venus. Um, so in astronomer speak, we would call this magnitude negative three or brighter. And the Perseids, uh, they typically travel at around 37 miles per second, which is crazy fast. Now, the best time to view the Perseids is going to be after 1030 p.m. in your local time zone. So in Flagstaff, Arizona, after 10.30 p.m. On the East Coast, after 10.30 p.m. In Canada, after 10.30 p.m. In Europe, after 10.30 p.m. In Asia, after 10.30 p.m. So I'm really hoping that I drove this point home for everybody that after 10.30 p.m. is when you're gonna get the best views of the, uh, of the Perseids. And now, of course, everybody says the later the better with the meteor showers, but in my experience, the big factor that determines when the best time to view a meteor shower is is the moon. Um, and now this is because the moon is a major source of light pollution. Um, I'm not sure where the myth came from that the best time to view is as early as possible, say 3 to 4 a.m. I think it has to do mostly with uh, the Earth's rotation, but it really doesn't make a difference. As long as the moon has set, you should get pretty spectacular views. So light pollution has the biggest effect on shower viewing and backyard astronomy in general. So the Perseids radiant, let's talk about the radiant. A meteor shower's radiant is the point in the sky that all the meteors appear to be coming out of. And furthermore, the shower is typically named after the constellation that houses its radiant. So if you think about the Perseids, it's a pretty short leap to figure out that the Perseids radiant is in Perseus. Um, so Perseus is pictured here um, this was an image from Stellarium, which is a really handy site to use if you're into stargazing and backyard astronomy. It can help you figure out what's up in the sky and where. Um, and now Perseus is going to be visible tonight, uh, rising on the eastern horizon, just slightly north of east, near the time this live stream ends. So once this live stream ends, you should see Perseus peeking out above the horizon. Um, now, additionally, it's easy to figure out where Perseus is, is because it's smack dab in the middle of the Pleiades and the bright star Capella. So the Pleiades is uh, also known as Subaru. It's that little star cluster in the bottom of the picture. Um, it's pretty easy to spot with your naked eye. Another way to find Perseus, alternatively, if the Pleiades and Capella are too low on the horizon for you, which may be the case, you can try to find Cassiopeia first, which is an easier constellation to find organically. It looks like a big W in the sky. So you can see it uh, in the top of the picture there. And if you find the middle point um, of that W and follow it downwards, it'll point directly towards Perseus. Uh, so if you find Cassiopeia, for example, and then you find the Pleiades, you should be able to tell, you know, Perseus is smack dab in the middle of those two. 
But I just want to stress that even if you can't find the radiant, you'll see meteors across the entire sky. The radiant is only the position in the sky that meteors appear to be radiating out of. Okay, so my viewing tips for you guys are pretty standard. Find a dark spot away from major sources of light pollution like streetlights. Big cities are gonna be worse. If you can go camping, that would be the best. Um, be patient, you may not see meteors immediately. Just keep your eyes on the sky. Um, and the Perseids, you know, are, are pretty easy to spot some meteors. So as long as you're willing to sit there for 15, 20 minutes, I would, I would be surprised if you didn't see a few meteors after that amount of time. Uh, and then finally, once again, I'm just going to reiterate this. If you can't find Perseus, don't worry. It's not a complete waste of your time. Just look east. Although, no matter where you look, you should still be able to see meteors. Now we're going to actually take a look at some actual Perseids meteors, courtesy of the Lowell Observatory All, uh, Cameras for All Sky Meteor Surveillance, or LOCAMS, which is the project, of course, that I support. Um, so, I want you guys to tell me in the chat if you can spot the meteors. The first four are going to be going. All right. So, of course, I'm just sitting here in my living room talking to myself. Um, so, we have a question. Great. Um, so, from Donnie Miller, are the Perseids the ones that produce green meteors? Uh, so, that's a good question. The color of meteors is actually completely dependent on their composition. So typically meteor shower meteors are gonna be pretty standard, just look like bright white flashes of light. Um, green meteors are probably what we call sporadic meteors, which are meteors that are not associated with any particular shower. Um, with that being said, there should still be a number of those meteors tonight. So, you know, there's always a good chance that you're gonna see a, a colorful meteor. Um, and now once again, you know, that was a great question and everybody should be posting the questions they wanna be answered in the chat. I would love to talk more about the questions uh, than anything else here. All right, so hopefully you guys saw the meteors. Uh, the, my favorite one is actually up in the left corner because there's two in the frame. So the first one is in the bottom right and the second one is in the top part of the screen. So first one's here and the second one's up here. All right, let's check out some more. So the bottom left one here is a pretty fairly bright uh, meteor for us, which is really good. So um, once again, you know, feel free to tell me if you can see the meteors. I don't wanna move slides too quickly on you guys. All right. <laughs> and the last set of meteors I have for you guys are here. And the last two. So all of these videos of meteors actually come from our Lowell Discovery Telescope Station, which is in Happy Jack and is similar to the All Sky camera that you're seeing on your screen. Uh, okay, awesome, we got a question. Okay, so um, MJ Baron Baronski, will meteors shoot from the radiant to the zenith or not necessarily? And hello from Pennsylvania, awesome. Hello, Pennsylvania. Um, so the meteors will not necessarily go from the radiant to the zenith, they will go from the radiant in all directions. Um, but sort of you can think about it as in if you see a meteor streak across the sky, if you were to track that meteor back and it tracks back to Perseus, most likely you're seeing a, a Perseids meteor shower meteor. All right. So hopefully everybody was able to spot the meteors in here. Um, and now I'm going to go back real quick for the people that are just joining us and remind everybody of the time to view and um, the best viewing tips. All right. Okay, so once again, after 10.30 p.m., your local time, that is when the moon sets tonight and that's gonna be the best time to view the meteor shower. This is because, of course, the moon is the biggest light polluter. Um, and then finally, the Perseids radiant is going to be in the constellation of Perseus. Um, so I'd love to take questions from you guys if you want to post them in the chat. Um, I know we have people monitoring, happy to watch them. All right. You guys are quiet tonight compared to last year. Well, 
you know, if we don't have any questions, and I'm sure the LDT All Sky camera is still, uh, oh, we do have a question. Okay. From Infomaniac, do you know why it was chosen to be named Perseus? Uh, so that's a good question. Perseus, uh, in Greek mythology at least, was a hero. Um, so Cassiopeia, the constellation that you see above Perseus, I can go back a little bit. Okay, yes, Cassiopeia, the constellation you see above Perseus, um, was a princess. And she got into a little tango with um, Medusa in, in one of the more popular stories. And Perseus actually came to save her. Uh, or sorry, Cassiopeia's daughter Andromeda is who Perseus saved. Cassiopeia was the queen and Andromeda is the princess. So if I had to guess, Perseus comes directly from Greek mythology there. Um, and of course, other cultures probably have other names for the constellation as well. Um, another question from 1224, Chris NG. How bright is the average meteor? How often do we get ones brighter than, say, Vega? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so Vega is of magnitude zero. Uh, so in astronomy, we have a really backwards magnitude scale. The smaller the number, the brighter the object. So for example, the sun is like negative 26. The moon is like negative 12. Venus is like negative three, Vega is zero. Um, and I would say during meteor showers, it's actually more common to get faint meteors. So closer to magnitudes three or four. However, the Perseids meteor shower is very well known for having bright meteors. So I would say that if you were to go out and watch for an entire hour, at least, you know, maybe a tenth of the meteors you see would be Vega brightness or brighter. Um, Question from Maria Vicenti. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, could you still have a chance to see a few in a city? Yeah, definitely. If they're bright enough and if you are in a good part of the city where you can still see some stars, um, I would say that you, you'll still have a chance to see a few. You, you won't see 50 to 100 an hour, um, but you should definitely still give it a shot. Um, I would say looking for stars is a really good gauge of whether or not you will be able to see anything. So if you can go out there and see some stars, I would wager that you'll be able to see some meteors. Not all, but some. All right. These are really good questions, you guys. I hope you keep them coming because otherwise I'm not going to have enough to talk about tonight. Um, but for now, let's keep going. Um, so we have our meteors here. Um, okay, <laughs> my PowerPoint is stalling a little bit. So let's jump to the LDT All Sky camera for now and talk about some of the other stuff you can see in there. Um, so essentially the LDT All Sky camera, um, you can see the directions and on obviously on your screen, north, south, east, and west. And then on the right in the east, I believe, uh, you can actually see the LDT, so the little discovery telescope there. Um, and we're seeing a few bright stars, but mostly clouded over. Hopefully, we get the uh, chance to see something on there. Um, all right. And if you guys have more questions, you know, that would be great. I am, oh, sorry, I didn't know. I am pulling my PowerPoint back up. Man, you know how uh, technology is these days. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay. So I'm hoping that some people are getting a chance to see Perseids tonight. I know that it's pretty clouded over in Arizona. Okay, we have another question um, from Grumman, Pilot99. Did the meteor dust field get refreshed when Swift Tuttle passed by a few decades ago? Yeah, that's a really good question. The answer is yes. So every time a comet comes close to the sun, the sun heats it up and it begins to drop particles, so to speak. Um, so when Comet Swift Tuttle comes close to the sun, it does indeed continue to drop particles. Uh, so next question from Anthony Jaluka. That's my dad. <laughs> Will the Perseids fade in the future? How far in the future before they are gone and how long will Swift Tuttle last? Um, so the Perseids will fade in the future. Eventually um, the meteoroid stream will disperse uh, in space and it's 
slowly going through this process all the time. Uh, never within our lifetimes will we see this happen fully. Um, but Comet Swift Tuttle will also eventually uh, become so small that it can't make its trips around the sun and uh, it will cease to refresh the meteorite stream. So a question from Lohith Knight, hopefully I pronounced your name right, is using binoculars for meteor useful in Andromeda 2? So that's a good question. For meteors, you're actually gonna wanna use the naked eye. Um, and this is just because meteors happen so quickly and they're so hard to predict exactly where they're gonna be um, that you really have to would have to be looking in exactly the right position before the meteor happens in order to see them with binoculars. Now Andromeda, on the other hand, M31, the Andromeda galaxy is a different story. That is an amazing object to look at with binoculars. It's nice in telescopes too, but since it is one of the more, the brighter objects in the sky, it is very good binocular object. And that's gonna be, um, I can actually point it out to you here. So if you see Cassiopeia, um, this little part uh, coming out the right hand side of the image is actually the bottom of the Andromeda constellation. So if you're able to find Cassiopeia, you look towards uh, the east of Cassiopeia, you'll see Andromeda and M31 is there. I would recommend going to Stellarium if you wanna get um, better directions to that. Um, cool. So, oh, before I go past this, I'll just show you guys. This station is actually the one at LDT that um, I took all of those meteor videos from. So that's pretty cool. Um, great, so I think if we don't have any more questions at the moment, we're gonna run over to trivia. So it's time for meteor trivia. Now, let me explain to you guys what the rules are and how this is gonna work. Um, basically, I'm going to ask various meteor related questions. I want you guys to type your responses into the chat as fast as you can. And the first to respond correctly is going to be the winner. I have um, folks from Lowell helping me and they're going to tell me whose username they saw first for each question. Uh, the last four questions will determine who gets the Clark Refractor books. I will definitely alert you when we've reached those questions. Um, all of the questions will have varying difficulty, but the four prize winning questions will start easy and increase in difficulty. So the last one will be the hardest. If you win a Clark Refractor book, I will announce your username on the air as the first correct response. Please then email info at lowell.edu with the subject Perseids 2021 trivia and your YouTube username. Don't forget to include your YouTube username, otherwise we don't know who you are. Um, and then my slight disclaimer here is that we cannot ship the books overseas, unfortunately. So although we welcome everybody to participate, recipients of the Clark books must be located in the US. All right. Is everybody ready to play some meteor trivia? Well, I hope you are because I can't see the chat. <laughs> so question one, what is the term for a rock particle or piece of debris in space that can become a meteoroid? All right. I'm waiting for you guys to come up with the right answer. And I'm monitoring chat. Well, I have people monitoring the chat, at least. Um, okay. I see some answers. They're not, oh, puppet. Okay, puppet. You had the right answer first. Oh, wait, oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> Sorry for the uh, false info there. It's actually, I see 1224 Chris NG. Yep, and I'm getting confirmation from the folks at Lowell. You had the answer first, and you are correct that it is a meteoroid. All right. Coming up on question two What is the name of the meteorite that was dropped during a massive meteor event on the 15th of February 2013? It's also the name of a Russian city. That's my hint. You guys got this. I This is the question that I haven't said during the talk. So I'm testing your knowledge here. Oh, okay, I see um, Anthony Jaluka, you got it right. It is Chelya Banks. Here we go, Chelya Banks. That was the thing, cool. Awesome, I see some other people have the right answer too. Okay, you know, this is just the warm up. First six questions aren't for any prizes, but you do get the title of Meteor Master still. I'll give that to you. 
Um, so what is the name of Lowell Observatory's Meteor Surveillance Network? Now, this is what I work on. So let's see who's been paying attention. LDT, close, Tyler, close. That is the Lowell Discovery Telescope. It's our research site. Kimberly Brink, you got it. It's low cams or the Lowell Observatory um, cameras for all sky meteor surveillance. All right, question four. What is the process that burns up a meteoroid in the atmosphere and causes a meteor? I said this very briefly at the beginning of the talk, so I'll be really impressed if somebody can get this. Tyler, you're right, it's ablation, nice, all right. Great, great, yeah, and I see some more answers of ablation. You guys are all right. Friction's a good answer too. Ablation basically is friction, so there you go. Uh, all right, fifth question. What constellation is the radiant of the Perseids located in? Clock's ticking. Perseus, yeah, Tyler, you're on the money with this. <laughs> nice, nice, I see lots of people are getting it. Okay, question six. What type of parent body creates meteor showers? My hint is that it is one of two main parent bodies of meteors. It's none of the minor ones like the moon or dwarf planets or other planets like Mars. Dawn, Dawn Var Varga, comet. Oh, Tyler, you got it first. Wow, you're fast on the keyboard. Yes, it is comets are the um, type of parent bodies that create meteor showers. All right, you guys. So I think we've had enough warm up. I want everybody to stretch their fingers because we are going to do the prize receiving questions. So just to remind you guys, whoever wins these next four questions are going to receive the Clark Refractor History of our 24 inch telescope coffee table book. Um, so make sure if you win, if I call out your name that you email info at lowell.edu. Tell them you're a Perseus 2021 um, trivia winner and include your YouTube username. Okay. Everybody ready? What is the most influential factor when deciding what time to view a meteor shower? It's an object you know and love and it produces massive amounts of light pollution. Coley Mixon, you got it. It's moon at the moon set time. I will accept that as well. So I'll just uh, announce your name again. Coley Mixon, you are the winner. Email info at Lowell. Okay, next question, next prize receiving question. A fireball is a meteor that is as bright as or brighter than which planet? Waiting. Close, okay. Grooman Pilot 99, you got it first. It's Venus is what defines a fireball. So I see lots of Mercury's. But uh, yes, the right answer is Venus. So um, once again, let me just find your name. Okay, yeah, Grumman Pilot 99. You are the winner. Email info at Lowell. Um, so question nine, what is the name of, a of the comet that produces the Perseids meteor shower? You guys got this, I said it. Yes, Tyler, Swift Tuttle. <laughs> so Tyler Wynn, I believe is how you pronounce that. It is Comet Swift Tuttle. So you are also a winner, please email info at Lowell. All right, last prize receiving question is coming up and it is the hardest one. So who first discovered the link between Comet Swift-Tuttle and the Perseids meteor shower? It's a tough one. Close, you guys, oh, well. <laughs> Not really close, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to be supportive here, but. Ah, uh, yes, Kimberly Brink. It is uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli. Um, so you are one of the winners and you can email info at Lowell to get your prize. Great, so you guys are really good with the trivia. This is super fun. Um, now, I would love to take your questions right now. Um, I. And here for you guys, that's the main part of this live stream is to answer any questions anyone has. Um, I will jump back and um, talk about the viewing tips again for anybody that's just joining us. All right. Okay, here we go. 
Cool. So once again, best time to view is going to be after 1030. Don't forget. Um, that's when the moon sets and the moon being the biggest light polluter is going to have the biggest effect on when the best time is to view the shower. Um, so I do see some questions. Okay. Um, so I see uh, astronomy flare. Earth is expected to pass from debris left out by a parabolic comet C1852K3 very soon. It will start after half an hour. Radiant will lie in Cetus. Will it get covered? Um, sadly, we're not going to have a live stream on that. That is going to be one of the more minor showers. Um, so, I mean, any meteor shower is fun. It always just adds to what you can see at night, right? Um, okay, a media, uh, another question from 1224 Chris NG. Why do meteor showers have a specific radiant point? Why don't they just fly in from wherever? So that's a good question. Um, now, the reason for this is that when a comet, pull up the picture of the comet, when a comet comes too close to the sun, um, it actually starts to heat up. So here's a good picture of a comet. And this would be um, a good representation of what a comet might look like when it is getting close to the sun. And now since that comet is on a specific orbit, all of the debris and stuff that is flying off of that comet is going to be in the orbital path of that comet. And therefore, when the Earth passes through the meteoroid stream from that comet, all of the meteors are going to be coming from the same location. Um, and that is why they appear to come from the same location as well in the sky. So that was a really good question. Thank you. Um, question from Kimberly Brink. How often do meteor showers happen? So that's a really good question also. Meteor showers, believe it or not, happen very frequently. You can actually go onto the IAU, the International Astronomical Union's website, and you can see a list of all of the meteor showers. There's a couple hundred, and some of them are pretty tiny, but they're still active. As for very big showers, um, and this would be a purely opinion thing, in my opinion, there's really like 10 big showers a year. Um, question from no one in particular, good name. <laughs> What's the anticipated peak meteor count? Good question. So we have something called the ZHR, the Zenith hourly rate. For the Perseids, that's going to be 50 to 100 meteors per hour. So if you're really lucky on a really good Perseids shower, you might even see like a meteor a minute. Um, question from Jen Fuff. When's the next exciting meteor shower happening? Um, so that's also a good question. That's definitely a matter of opinion. Um, we have a number of really good meteor showers coming up. If you're talking about meteor showers on par with the Perseids, I would say there's really only one other that can rival the Perseids, and that would be the Geminids in December. Um, however, we have a ton of really good meteor showers between now and then, like the Leonids and the Draconids and lots of other good stuff. So good question. Um, Cruz Lang. The comet with an orbital period of 133 years causes a meteor shower yearly. How is this? Why not every 133 years? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the reason for this is that comet um, Swift-Tuttle, it comes close to the sun, right? Uh, releases debris, so it creates this meteor stream within its orbit. And then once a year, the Earth passes through the orbit of comet Swift-Tuttle. So, um, there's so much debris there that the Earth is not big enough to actually clear out that meteoroid stream. So just once a year, we pass through it. Now, every 133 years, Comet Swift-Tuttle comes back and adds to the meteoroid stream. So that's a good question. Um, you know, keep these questions coming. I see, um, I see, is this the email to reach you all? Info at lol.edu. Yeah, that's correct. So anybody that won the trivia is going to be info at lol.edu. Uh, another question from Sean Demko. What is the best place in the US to view showers and space in general with the lowest light pollution? I really want to visit someday. That's a good question. Um, once again, you know, I think that you could argue that a number of places are really good. I'd say very rural, rural places are going to be the best. So, you know, farmlands, woods, uh, as long as you can get a clear view of the sky. I personally really like Flagstaff. I um, mean, you know, I, I'm obviously biased in this, but Flagstaff is what we call an international dark sky city. So there are laws on outdoor lighting fixtures in Flagstaff that um, 
businesses have to obey and it makes it a really good place to view the sky. And plus, you know, you have Lowell Observatory right there to help you, so. Um, cool, I see. Can, can we view using infrared goggles? Uh, sadly, I don't think you're gonna get very far that way. <laughs> um, I just, I don't think that the meteors are gonna be giving up enough infrared radiation that you'd be able to see them uh, against the background, so. But you know what, hey, give it a try and let me know what you find because I think that would be really cool if you could. Uh, question from Robert Yankowski. What is the approximate energy of the individual meteors and the entire shower in, average, in an average year compared to something we might be familiar with? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. That is uh, a lot of conversion would have to happen there, sadly. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, okay. From Nick Mazur, can you talk about the Leonid meteor storms? Yeah, I can talk about that briefly. So um, the Leonid meteor shower is really interesting because it has been observed throughout history to occasionally experience these things called meteor storms. Um, and the, what would happen during these meteor storms is that there would be thousands of meteors in an hour. I mean, you would be seeing meteors every second, multiple ones. Um, and these were recorded as early as some of the Chinese dynasties. Um, and they were described as meteors falling from the, or stars falling from the sky like rain. So um, pretty cool. And I think we do have predictions for the Leonid storms, how often they occur. I don't know off the top of my head, but it should be really easy Google search for you. Personally, I would really love to see one of these meteor storms um, with my own two eyes, because I think that would be so cool. Um, there's another phenomenon that is associated with some meteor showers like the Leonids and also like the Lyrids, which happened back in April. And these are meteor outbursts. So they're not necessarily meteor storms, but they are periods of heightened intensity for the meteor showers. Um, so the Lyrids, once again, you can actually predict when that's gonna happen for the Lyrids, um, and I'm sure somebody has. A uh, question from Mike Roy. Uh, oh yeah, I should mention meteorshowers.org has a really nice visualization of meteor showers in the meteoroid streams. Um, and it really helps you to see how the earth is passing through those streams. So I definitely recommend going to meteorshowers.org and checking those out. Um, and I'll just mention before I get back to the questions here that the uh, LDT all sky camera is starting to clear up a little bit. So we could switch to that. I don't actually have any more PowerPoint slides to go through. So now I'm just, you know, talking to you guys, answering your questions, which is what I like to do more than just drone on with some PowerPoint. So we can see the LDT all sky camera. We can actually see the Milky Way just a little bit, which is really neat. At least I think that's what I'm seeing. And we see some nice bright stars. So. If we're really lucky, maybe we'll actually catch some meteors on the LDT. Now, the interesting thing about the all sky camera is that it's um, actually taking these long exposure shots. So if a meteor shows up on the all sky cam, oh, do we see one? Oh, oh SGR at the bottom, um, Jupiter at the bottom left. Oh, okay, okay. So on the bottom left of the screen, there should be a very bright point um, on the all sky camera and that is Jupiter. Uh, and Sagittarius is going to be at the bottom of your screen. Now, Sagittarius is a fun constellation, and I know I'm getting sidetracked here, but Sagittarius has what's known as the teapot asterism. So if you look at it for long enough, you should be able to see a teapot. And the spout of the teapot points you directly to um, the center of the Milky Way. Uh, so I think that that's really cool. Um, so back to questions anyways. I have one from Mike Roy. Are the meteoroids moving as fast as the Earth, or are they almost still? I mean, is the Earth blasting through the debris really fast, uh, so the comet debris is just sitting there? That's a good question. Um, so the comet debris is moving. However, like you said, compared to the speed at which the Earth is moving through it, it's fairly negligible. Now, it's not entirely negligible, as we can actually use um, the trajectories of these meteors. We can calculate them and figure out what their orbit is and also the velocity they're traveling at in space. But uh, yeah, as far as the Earth is concerned, it pretty much just plows through the meteoroid stream. Um, question from Robert Yankowski. Has anyone ever proposed a method to harvest meteor energy someday in future centuries? Wow, that's a loaded question. 
I have not um, had any of those methods proposed to me yet, um, but my guess would be at the moment, it would probably cost more money to get that energy than it would cost, uh, than you would get out of it, if that makes sense. And that's actually a similar thing with like um, uh, mining, space mining. Everybody always asks me about that and like, why aren't we doing that? There's all this precious metals out there in the solar system just waiting to be taken advantage of. And number one is that it's really, really, really expensive to actually get there and mine it, so much so that you're probably not going to even break even um, with the cost. But then also, you know, when we get into the asteroid mining thing, you got to talk about inflation with the market and all that stuff. But that is a conversation for another time. Um, another question from MJ Baronsky. Could you uh, see still see meteors up until sunrise? Name is Mike. Oh, Mike, sorry. <laughs> Yes, you can see meteors up until sunrise. In fact, the Perseids meteor shower has actually been active for a week, maybe a couple of weeks at this point, and it will continue to be active until August 26th. So no matter what, or sorry, yes, August 26th, yeah, that's right. So no matter, during this time, no matter if the sun's in the sky or you can see the meteors or not, meteors are happening. They are coming into the atmosphere. Um, as we speak. Uh, so I see um, Saturn on the LDT all sky camera is just to the right of Jupiter. So it's going to be another very bright one. Um, and then I will just, you know, mention to everybody the opposition of Saturn was last week, last Monday, I believe, or last Sunday night, I believe. Um, and that is Saturn's closest approach to the Earth. It's also when Saturn is directly opposite to us from the sun. So it's some of the best viewing conditions. And then the opposition of Jupiter is going to be Thursday next week. So a week from tomorrow. Um, and that will be when Jupiter is at, it is optimal observing conditions. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, I see no one in particular. Yes, Saturn is on the LD LDT All Sky camera as well. Um, isn't Sagittarius the black hole in the middle of the Milky Way? Yeah, this is a meteor shower related, but I will, I'll um, humor you anyways. Uh, Sagittarius A is the name of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, but there is also a constellation called Sagittarius. Um, what is the date range for, okay, that is, Lowell's got that. Okay, cool, so can we see the meteors tonight? Yes, you can. Tonight's the peak night of the Perseids, so you will be seeing the most amount of um, meteors tonight if you are in a location where the weather allows you to view them. So um, keep that in mind. Um, so we'll also be doing a live stream. I won't be doing it, but Lowell Observatory will also be hosting a live stream next Thursday. A uh, week from tomorrow for the Jupiter's opposition. It is part of the Clark 125th celebration this year. Um, so I see some questions on the time we should be out tonight. Uh, so let's go through this again. For anybody that's just tuned into the stream to get a little bit of viewing help, the best time is after 1030. That is when the moon sets. So that is when you're gonna have the least amount of light pollution hindering your viewing conditions. Um, so once again, the moon is a waxing crescent tonight. Um, so make sure that you uh, take advantage of the fact that the moon sets very early and get a chance to see the meteor shower. Um, and yes, even in Arizona, this is the time you're gonna wanna look and you know, try to avoid the moon <laughs> is my best advice for you. Um, Hello all, of, hello, all of the little educators, by the way, that are watching. Um, and 1030 in your local time zone. So I don't care where you are, your local time 1030. When your watch says 1030, that should be when you're good to go. Um, and I mean, granted, you could go out before 1030 and you'll probably still see a fair amount of meteors. It will just be um, the best uh, if you go after the moon has set. Um, okay, so let's take a look. Um, I know some people have just jumped in. So I wanted to show you guys these videos of actual Perseids meteors that I took once again. I took these just last night. Um, so these are Perseids meteors from this year. Uh, my favorite is the one in the left because there are two meteors there. There's one in the bottom right of that image and one in the upper part. Um, 
So we have more on the screen. I'll start them for you guys while I field some more questions. Um, the Oh, so the black dot line running across the camera. Uh, in the Aldi to All Sky cam, I, my guess would be that that's just a cloud. If I'm looking at the same thing I think you're looking at. Um, I see a question from Ted Turner. Can meteors mess with or damage satellites? Can they take down Starlink? Um, that's a really good question. And uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, so typically, meteors have not been able to take down any satellites um, or, you know, harm anything that we have in orbit. However, we do, um, many, uh, many people <laughs> or businesses or NASA that have things in orbit do take precautions during meteor showers like this one. So for like example, none of the astronauts on the ISS are going to do a spacewalk while they think they might be in danger of being hit by a Perseid. Um, satellites may take precautions like folding in wings or anything that could get potentially damaged. Um, all right. Hi again from Mike Roy. Hi, Mike. How freaking wide is the comet debris field? I mean, if the Earth is blasting through it for two weeks, it must be massive. Or am I thinking about this the wrong way? No, you're thinking about it right. And, you know, the truth is, as time goes on, meteoroid streams get wider and wider and wider as they start dispersing into space. Um, so it does take the earth quite a while to get through it. We're just going, you know, through the thickest part of it right now. Um, question from Denise Flores. Will any of the meteors harm the earth? The Perseids meteors will not. So you're totally safe. The earth actually gets hit with some crazy amount of meteors, um, constant, I mean like tons, like the weight unit tons of meteors. Um, or meteoroids or debris hit the earth. It's just that most of it is tiny little particles, tiny little dust particles that nobody notices. Um, now, larger meteors can certainly harm the earth. And this is something that lots of people study. I mean, NASA even has um, objectives in order to try and make sure that we're watching out for massive near earth objects is what we call them that may come too close to the earth or may hit us. Um, and we're looking for, you know, things that are large enough to impact cities. For example, the 2013 event in Chelyabinsk, it was actually a fairly small meteoroid compared to some of the very major um, extinctors in history. Um, and it was still enough to blow the windows out of buildings and harm people in that way. So. Meteors tonight from the Perseids and in general, no, are not going to be big enough, but just know that people are out there watching for those massive meteors that might cause more of a potential threat. Um, okay, so I have a question from Tyler. When did Swift Tuttle first create the Perseids meteor field? Um, that's a good question. I don't have an exact date for you, but whenever Comet Swift Tuttle first came to the sun, it started letting off debris. Um, and now comets live in something called the Oort cloud. So that's the very most further regions of the solar system. And a very, uh, a well-known hypothesis for how comets actually come into being is that, you know, collisions might be occurring in the Oort cloud that eject something out and towards the sun and put them onto an orbit that brings them close to us, like comets with Tuttle and others. Uh, okay. Uh, do we have any more questions? I'm trying to see. Uh, <laughs> I see one, do astronomers wish on shooting stars? Well, I sure do because I don't know what else to wish on. <laughs> um, okay, so I have, are they viewable in Arkansas? Uh, yeah, Perseids meteors are viewable everywhere on the earth. No matter where you are, the best time to view tonight is going to be after 10.30 p.m. Should we look at some more meteors here? These are some of the brighter ones I took from last night up on the screen now. Um, all right, cool, cool, cool. Um, do the meteors also land on other planets like Mars and Venus? Probably at different days than today. So that's a good, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question, Sean. And the answer is yeah. Every single planet, every object in the solar system is getting hit by debris in the solar system. 
it's just that it's not necessarily going to be the same. Like, for example, maybe Venus and Mars are able to make it into meteoroid streams that the Earth maybe just slightly skims or misses. So the Mars and Venus may see different meteor showers as stronger than us, but the short answer to your question is yes, they are getting hit by meteors as well. Um, how often do meteor showers occur? Uh, meteor showers are happening all the time. Uh, once again, you can go to the IAU, the International Astronomical Union's website, and see a list of all of the known showers, and there are hundreds of them. So, um, you know, I feel like chances are you're going to be able to see that a meteor shower is active at any given time. However, most of those meteor showers are very minor with maybe a couple of meteors per hour. So you're not really going to be able to distinguish them from say a meteor shower night like tonight with the Perseids that are producing 50 to 100 meteors. But good question. Um, all right, yeah, so I see when is the next meteor shower? That's gonna be the Orionids, which will be um, from October 2nd to November 7th. They peak on the night of October 20th. Um, so definitely get out and see the Orionids. Those are also a pretty spectacular shower. One of the ones that LOCAMS, the uh, project I work for, is interested in as well. So keep that in mind. Um, I see, thank you, thank you guys for tuning in, everybody that is thanking me. Thank you. <laughs> um, and yes, Lowell Observatory does give tours. Right now, I believe you have to um, book them ahead of time, but I, if I am wrong on that, please correct me, my team. Um, so what makes the Perseids better than the other meteor showers? Is it something to do with Swift Tuttle itself or the orbit? Um, that's a good question. Honestly, when you start getting to words like better and worse, it all becomes sort of a matter of opinion. But it is a, I would say, a fairly widely held opinion that the Perseids are one of, if not the best meteor shower. And that's purely because, number one, they're producing so many meteors per hour. They're producing 50 to 100 meteors per hour, which is a crazy amount of meteors. Number two, the Perseids are really well known for their fireballs. So that's going to be the very bright meteors that are brighter than Venus or as bright as Venus. And I mean, those are the ones where you're walking down the road and you see them streak across the sky and you kind of jump for a second. So Perseids are well known for those as well, whereas other meteor showers aren't so much. Uh, OK, will they be visible on Monday, Tuesday night? Yes. So um, the Perseids will be visible until August 26th is when they're considered to be active until um, so even if you guys have bad weather tonight or whatever, and you go out tomorrow or the night after, you should still be able to see a fair amount of Perseids meteors. Um, great. So does the Earth pick up a significant amount of debris and permanent orbit that don't fall as meteors? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by permanent orbit, but the Earth does pick up a significant amount of space dust every single day. We just don't notice it because it's uh, the particles are so small to us, um, but I, you know, I don't know the number off the top of my head. You could Google it. Um, it is a pretty crazy large number of how much uh, debris we actually are able to pick up over a year. Um, okay. Oh, thank you, Ronnie. 10 tons. Yeah, so that's like a ton, get it? A ton of debris for the Earth to actually um, accumulate over a year. Uh, every day, yeah, wow, oh, that was a lot. Okay, question from Lorena Gloria. Can you please explain what an Earth grazer meteor is and how likely it is to see one in Arizona? Um, so I actually haven't heard that term before. Um, if I had to guess, based on um, how it sounds rare, if you're talking about fireballs or bullides, which are typically the talked about as the two major types of meteors. So fireballs are going to be those meteors that are bright or brighter than Venus. Bullides are fireballs that explode, basically, or fragment is what we call it in the atmosphere. Um, and those happen not so frequently um, as you might think. So you really just got to be at the right place at the right time. 
Uh, so what are we seeing on the screens? The screens right now are showing meteors that were captured by, I can show you, um, here we go, by these cameras were the ones that captured all of these meteors just last night. So these are all Perseids meteors caught by the Lowell Observatory cameras for all sky meteor surveillance. Um, do various meteor showers have different chemical reactions with the Earth's atmosphere? That's a good question, Coley. Um, so the chemical reactions that occur between a meteor and the Earth's atmosphere um, are not as extensive as you might think. Primarily, a meteor will go through that process of ablation, so friction between the meteor and the um, air particles cause the meteor to heat up and burn up, which is why you see that streak of light in the sky. Now, during that ablation process, um, the composition of the meteor is going to determine what sort of reactions take place and, in turn, what color the meteor is. Um, meteors that are in the same meteor shower all have the same composition, more or less, because they come from the same parent body. Um, cool. So. It looks like the questions are slowing down and we are coming up to the top of the hour. So do we have any last minute questions that I can answer before I sign off tonight? Um, okay, Robert, I see. Uh, so it seems like the added mass over centuries could impact the Earth's rotation or even orbit. Any evidence of that or even those peak years impacting climate? Um, good question. Uh, but unfortunately, maybe not so excitingly, the answer is no, it doesn't really affect our orbit in any significant way. Um, question from 1224 Chris NG. If low cams and other cameras triangulate a sporadic meteor, can it tell where it came from? That's a really good question. You're actually hitting on one of the goals of um, me and my coworkers. Uh, so basically what we do every night for meteors like these, the ones that I just pulled up on your screen, in addition to getting these super nice videos, our cameras also determine the coordinates of these meteors. And if more than one camera observes the same meteor, we're able to use a process called parallax in order to determine what the orbit was of that meteor. Then using the orbit, we try to identify the parent bodies of those meteors. Um, so that is a big uh, goal of ours. So question from Aaron Hagman or Hagman, what bright star is low in the Southwest right now? Oh, wow, You're really testing my astronomy knowledge. Let me see, Southwest, hmm. Hmm, uh, you know what? I don't wanna give you an answer that's wrong. I'm thinking Antares and Scorpius. That, yeah, that would be my best guess. If it's red, it's Antares. There's a couple of bright stars in Scorpio and Sagittarius, which are gonna be um, near the area you're talking about in the South, Southwest. Um, that would be my guess. Uh, any resources that you can suggest to learn constellations in the least amount of time? Yeah, definitely look up Stellarium, stellarium-web.org. It shows you, you can put in your location information. It'll tell you exactly what's in the sky above you that night, including planets, objects of interest, and constellations. It's how I learned the constellations, truthfully. Um, it just really helps if you can have it up. Um, and really learning the constellations just takes a little bit of time. Um, the thing about learning constellations is that it's really hard to get started when you don't know where anything is. But once you start to identify one or two constellations, you can sort of lean on those to determine where other ones are, and it becomes a lot easier from that point on. I would suggest, you know, starting with the easy ones, like trying to find the Big Dipper, trying to find the Little Dipper, trying to find Cassiopeia. Perseus is even a good one to start with, I would say. Um, all right. So um, it seems like the questions are slowing down. I would love to take any more last minute questions. Maybe we can switch back to the LDT all sky camera real quick and just see how the conditions are looking up there. All right. Um, oh, well, it looks like we may have gotten a little bit worse. <laughs> That's unfortunate. I mean, Arizona is right in the middle of monsoon season, but 
we'll take what we can get, right? Cool. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to um, say my goodbyes to you guys. This has been a really fun stream, even though I had a few technical difficulties every once in a while. Um, but I'm really happy everybody tuned in. You guys had great questions. The trivia was super fun. I would love to do that again with like a really full fleshed out um, session of trivia and make sure everybody that won the Clark Refactor books contacts info at LOL. Um, otherwise, I think we're good to go. So I'm gonna sign off. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is super fun.